Today we have with us James Chikluna from WH Partners. Good morning, James. Hi, good morning. Thank you for welcoming our um, invitation. Thanks for your invitation. James, uh, you, you've been ranked as for, for a number of years as a top tier lawyer in the gaming industry. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, I mean, I don't think I don't think the ranking necessarily <laughs> <laughs> implies, yeah, you know, keep, any, anything, more informed, anything, yeah. <laughs> anything in particular. Um, I, I very much enjoy my job, and I was fortunate to to have life take me in a direction where I um, I, I, I practiced alongside, you know, some some very very good lawyers with whom I trained um, in the UK, um, and also here, very fortunate to have partners who are interested in the same fields of the law that I'm interested in. Uh, in effect, I would say that by training, I'm a sort of hybrid uh, corporate and gambling lawyer. Um, corporate in the sense that I did a lot of company law and a lot of merger and acquisition work. Um, and I kind of gravitated towards the gambling and regulation of gambling. I started doing corporate work for gambling businesses and then got more involved in the regulatory side. And I developed quite a keen interest in, uh, in the way this industry is regulated. Uh, why it should be regulated, what the key points to regulate are, uh, specifically in the online gambling world, I must say. Uh, so most of my experience to date has revolved around online gambling, uh, probably the ecosystem broadly, so you know everything from the product development, platform development to B two C operations, but also um, you know re responsibilities that banks have in relation to this industry, uh, payments industry related to this. So really, to, to, my, to my own knowledge, you lecture at the University of Malta. Um, uh, what advice do you have for up and coming? Uh, um, lawyers in the gaming industry and even in other emerging technologies. So, so two, of, two of my partners, the WH Partners and I, lecture one unit uh, okay. on gaming law at the University of Malta. Um, I, I think if I, if I might offer any advice to sort of people who are interested in this field of the law, is, it's pretty much the same as I would offer to anyone who's interested in any other particular field of the law, which is, you know, commit to it, read a lot, um, read both the law and its interpretation and also read about the industry um, try to get exposure in terms of understanding how the industry works because you cannot look at the law in isolation the, the law makes sense if it is interpreted in a way that makes sense and that normally implies a very good understanding of what it is you're applying it to um, I find it helps immensely to have a deep understanding of the area to which you're trying to interpret the law. Um, I think you know, that sort of understanding and, and the ability to mix the knowledge of the law with knowledge of a particular area of, of industry really makes the distinction between a, a decent and a very good lawyer. Okay, let's turn to a little bit of more of opinion-based questions related to the sectors that even your firm um, uh, look into or, and, and work uh, within. Uh, the Maltese government was planning that by 2021 um, uh, achieve strong results when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, do you still see that the government is on track? Look, I think there's a lot of... Uh, uh, probably this is because of some PR twists that were given by you know, perhaps the government, perhaps others in terms of uh, confusing, uh, I think, <laughs> blockchain and gambling and artificial intelligence. So they're completely different things, right? Um, and, and I think when it comes to AI, um, it's very hard to see the development of an infrastructure to support R&D, so research and development related to AI, if you don't have the right incentives. And incentives, aren't, to my mind, government handouts. Um, I think primarily, and, and these are lessons learned from the US, for instance, where access to venture capital is far easier and uncomplicated. Um, people who are interested in AI, in R&D, in developing AI products uh, um, need the funding. And the amount of funding that these people need is typically beyond what 
the government of a small state like Malta, even factoring in EU funds, is able to give. So the solution, I think, would be to incentivize private sector investment. And how would you do that? You would do that through tax credits, right? Or through some other tax incent incentives, where if an investor is effectively taking a higher risk investing in a young R&D-based business, then they are incentivized for that. Uh, I don't think you can grow an industry magically out of PR and fancy buzzwords. Uh, there has to be the money backing the industry, there has to be an ecosystem which makes it easier for people to invest their time and resources in R&D, uh, easier for people to bring in and employ people from countries outside the EU who have the capability to work on this type of development. So it's a mix of things. And it's not something that can happen over a very short period of time. I think it takes years. There's other models as well which could work together with um, in incentivizing private investment into an area like AI. For example, the Israeli government gets involved very directly in venture capital type projects. So they have, you know, they have a fund, a government-run fund, which invests and then takes equity, shareholding, basically, right, in, uh, in young and promising talent, not only in AI, but in a whole range of, of sort of early stage, startup and early stage businesses. Um, I don't know that Malta is at that stage yet where that could be done, but, but incentivizing private investment is definitely something that can and should be done. And by the way, I feel quite strongly about opening the door to, to, to local investors, right? So incentivizing Maltese people or people who live here and are taxed here to be able to invest in something like this and giving them a tax advantage. Malta's tax ecosystem tends to favor people who come here from outside and bring business. Uh, I think the way our economy has developed, it's, it's high time now that um, people who have been successful here or who have also exported their business from here also receive some sort of uh, ta tax, tax advantages of the sort, especially where they're incentivized to reinvest into the community. And if you, if you look at investing in, in young businesses you know, as helping to create an ecosystem, and then I think that, that that does tick the box as reinvesting in the community. Yes, but mentioning tax in, uh, incentives, um, uh, corporate tax in Malta has been scrutinized um, quite a number of times by um, European institutions and even by, by other international institutions. Um, do you think that such environment or a possible overhaul can possibly affect um, the gaming industry, AI and other emerging technologies? Uh -huh. I think it's important to keep things in, in perspective. I mean, small states like Malta, there are others in, uh, in our region as well, um, need to be able to not only live but thrive. And, and states which are um, not blessed with natural resources, not, not blessed you know, with, with, with the size, or some of them, like us, also have, have a colonial history. Um, where we're entirely dependent on, 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 on others, needs to be able to use effectively what they can in order to live and live well. And tax competition is one of those things. No, no two states, no two countries in Europe apply the exact tax rates, right? Um, this applies across corporation tax. Uh, there is a level of uh, harmonization on VAT and VAT rates, but there are still differences within, within, within a range. And so it is quite important, I think, to allow for a degree of, of tax competition. Uh, that helps business, but it helps small states like us survive. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of talk about some sort of revamp of Malta's corporation tax system, and I don't think that a revamp of corporation tax, if we are talking about really bottom line taxation, is going to make an enormous difference uh, to the existing uh, businesses, businesses here on the, on the island. 
uh, so long as there aren't other factors which come into the equation and which influence a decision to stay or leave. And these other factors can range from literally quality of life for employees, ease of doing business with banks and financial institutions, transparency in public administration, so a lot of other things, right, which might make a far bigger difference than a few percentage points in um, bottom line tax exposure. Uh, I, I think tax alone, even if it were, and I, I have absolutely no knowledge of this being about to happen, I, I, I'm just you know, aware of there being this, this discussion going on for years and years because of pressures mostly from certain larger European states. Uh, but I think it's other factors really that have a, a, key, a key determining impact on, on whether you see a, uh, a migration of, uh, of businesses from here. Uh, I don't think that it would be tax, tax alone. Okay. But that, sorry, that also serves, in my view, to show, <coughs> if I am right, that it is not only tax, although it is in part tax, that attracts businesses here. I from experience in the, ga in the gambling industry, I can tell you that tax is only a part of it. The rest is, is the, the regulation, it's the ecosystem with availability of trained people. Such as the workforce? The workforce, precisely. Um, it's the workforce, it is the whole sort of approach and acceptance and, um, and the feeling that there is, and the community feeling, yes? In, in, in this industry that helped create this, this mass, this critical mass uh, of, of online gambling businesses here. Now we can have a, a, a long and detailed discussion about whether all of them were desirable or some of them. I think on balance, um, on balance, I think that uh, this was an industry which, if, if seen from a, a Maltese, uh, self-interested the point of view, a uh, national sort of state point of view, it's an industry which is very good to have. Uh, when it comes to uh, a strong workforce um, and an island such as ours, uh, the workforce is considered as gold. Um, do you think that uh, we need to invest further in um, educational programs that would maintain the current workforce but cre create even a stronger one for the future ahead? Look, one of the biggest issues Malta has, and it is not something that, that can be resolved very easily, is uh, it's small and its population, it, its native population is small. With a growing economy <coughs> requiring a greater supply of skilled workforce, there's only so many people you can get through the education system. <coughs> um, if you combine that with sort of falling birth rates amongst the native population, then it becomes even harder, which means that Malta becomes dependent on two things, being extremely efficient in the management of its education system and ensuring that the highest possible percentage of people pass through the system and result in people with sufficient skills uh, and training to contribute to, to the economy. And secondly, on importing skills and knowledge, and there's absolutely no shame in that. Um, on the contrary, it is necessary, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's proven by time that when you have highly skilled people coming in, right, then they are also rubbing off on the local population and helping to train them. Um, I don't think that there is anybody who, who questions the need for Malta to continue to, to facilitate the I'm using very crude language here, but <laughs> literally the importation of uh, highly skilled people to, to contribute, to work here, contribute to, to, to the economy. Um, the, the questions that you see, especially in sort of popular media and social media, I think relate to a different type of, of migration. It's not, our, it's, it's, it's not for me to comment really on, on that, not certainly not during this interview. You've worked in a number of international ecosystems. Do you still see Malta as a strong ecosystem for the international market to invest in this island? But it, well, it depends what international market you're referring to. Um, Malta is going through quite a, quite a rough patch 
at the moment because of, uh, because of Manival, because of issues with governance, because of the growth of the economy, I think, to an extent where certain very fundamental changes are, are required for it to be sustainable. Um, the, the growth, I think, was also quite condensed time-wise, very sudden. Um, and, uh, and when you have that type of growth, then you know, things uh, start to creak. Uh, things uh, where foundations are not as solid as they could be, and you add weight, that's an issue, as any, any structural engineer or perito Malta will tell you. Um, and I think that's exactly, that's exactly what happened. So uh, I, I think there is, there, is, there is a phase now, probably which is going to be a few years longer, <coughs> where, where Malta will need to adapt, rejuvenate, um, up its game uh, in terms of governance, public administration, but also in terms of its education system, in terms of training, in terms of the professions, in terms of the legal profession, for instance, is not well regulated at all in Malta. The Chamber of Advocates has been calling out for years for the proper regulation of, of the legal profession. Uh, now, whether or not it has you know, consulted properly with its members, whether or not it has really engaged is a different matter altogether, but I think it, it, it is very clear for anybody sitting in government, it is clear to any lawyer, it is clear to people in business who deal with lawyers that the legal profession needs to be mu much better regulated. So there's all these different parts of the puzzle which need to come together. And, and if they do, and I'm very, I'm very hopeful and optimistic about them doing so, I think Malta will be a far better place um, to work, to live, to do business. Uh, two years uh, down the line from a new regulatory framework um, uh, for, the, for the gaming industry in Malta. Uh, what, uh, what, what is your assessment um, uh, of such changes? You know, in Malta first specifically regulated the, the online gambling sector in, in 2004 with the remote gaming regulations. So it, uh, it was high time, I think, for, for things to be updated. It was also high time for the whole uh, uh, regulation of gambling to be looked at because it was very fragmented <laughs> um, and it was, it was brought together in one act um, which came into force in August of 2018, uh, the Gaming Act. Uh, I, I think overall it has been positive. I think overall it laid the foundations for things to be simpler and more efficient. The devil is in the detail. A lot of the detail is drawn up by people who sit within the regulator, who I think on, on, on balance have done a good job. Um, but it is, it is very important to remain uh, alert to tweaking things which are not really optimal. Um, if the intention of the act and the changes in the law were for things to be more efficient, for there not to be duplication, unnecessary duplication of controls, then it is a little bit, a little bit ironic that at a practical level you still encounter duplication of controls which seem very formalistic, unnecessary and frankly reminiscent of a very sort of old school uh, Soviet bloc type approach to public administration and ticking boxes. And unfortunately at a, uh, at a certain level we still come across that. Um, I know that it is the intention of people who are in management at the, at the regulator here at the MGA to change that and that might also entail a few tweaks to some of the regulations made under the, the Parent Act, which is the, the, the Gaming Act. Let's turn uh, on to fintech. Um, do you see uh, Malta's, Malta's financial authorities doing enough when it comes to fintech and the related investment? I think that fintech is a, a buzzword which became very popular in Malta as a consequence of uh, Malta first seeking to place itself on the map in terms of the blockchain uh, ecosystem. Um, and again, I think it's one of those things that is a bit confusing. Um, fintech basically is a sort of abbreviation of financial technology and that <laughs> You know, there have been fintech companies around for decades. You know, there are companies that help banks uh, develop software to be able to clear payments between them. There are companies that help settle 
uh, the purchase and sale of stocks and bonds around the world. And so this is all fintech, right? Um, and, and in that respect, Malta is very late to the game. So Malta came to the game uh, with its, uh, its shout of wanting to be a leader in terms of, of regulation of blockchain and, uh, and, and uh, issuing, issuance of cryptocurrencies, which frankly speaking, you know, let's not mince our words, uh, was, was a sort of hyped up PR stunt which hasn't gone very well for several reasons and I'm very happy to discuss the reasons with you. Um, I think if Malta wants to be a so-called so hub for anything, it must have in place um, regulation which is in line with international standard, but which does not seek to go over and above all sort of common sense in terms of checks and controls so much that it will, it will stifle startups and innovation. I think if Malta wants to attract the big players of this world in, in any uh, industry, let's say fintech, right? It's, it's late to the game, so it's going to have to be something probably other than regulation as well that attracts them. Um, let us not carry on confusing fintech with, uh, with, with blockchain. Are there block applications used using distributed ledger technology in the fintech space? Yes, for sure. Uh, are there useful applications? For sure. Um, are they the only type of uh, fintech out there? Absolutely not. Will they ever be, be the only type of fintech out there? Absolutely not, in my view. Not in my lifetime, for sure. Um, so, so the discussion really is, is quite broad and we always go back to these fundamentals. You need to have a strong regula regulatory infrastructure, but not overboard. You need to have a regulator which is efficient. You need to have people in the regulator linking in now to what we spoke of in terms of education and skilled workforce. You need to have people in the regulator who are skilled enough to be able to analyze, properly analyze and assess what they're, what they're looking at if they're reviewing an application, if they're presented with, with a problem. It's very difficult. Um, you need to have an environment around us where people who are executives and who are used to living in the great and beautiful cities of the world with access to nature, you know, by driving for an hour or two or hopping on a plane for 30 minutes or whatever, um, are happy to live with their families. So it's, it has to be seen organically. Um, if Mota can move in this direction, and we have a lot of these elements already, but I don't think we're there just yet. We're probably there in terms of the regulation of blockchain. Um, if you look at it narrowly in terms of some of the very big players in the world, but certainly the regulation put in place went, I think, over and above in order to attract any uh, early stage type uh, businesses which weren't backed by very significant capital. Um, and and uh, I can understand the dilemma that, uh, f that those legislating were faced with in terms of balancing uh, innovation with all of the issues that were emerging and you know making sure that we're, Malta appears to be uh, to, uh, to have its ducks in a row when it comes to anti-money laundering and so on but uh, it, uh, the regulatory ecosystem they set up I think when it's too complicated. Coming up to a conclusion uh, why should anyone listening uh, to this uh, conversation um, tap into Malta to invest in this island. If we start with what we, we, we set out speaking about in this interview, which is where my core expertise is really in the online gambling industry, well, there is good regulation. There is an existing ecosystem which includes availability of a, a significant skill base of human resources. Um, there is a community. Um, there are well-trained, and seasoned professionals, if you look at the, the you know, big audit firms, if you look at a handful of uh, you know, law firms, if you look at uh, a handful of uh, or more of you know, independent consultants with very specific technical expertise, but especially if you look really at people, I think, who, who have, have grown with a lot of the online gambling businesses uh, established here. So I think those are all very significant advantages. 
Um, if you look at uh, other areas of business, some of which we touched upon, say fintech, right? Um, I would say that in, in certain areas, so if you're looking at blockchain related fintech, if you are still looking at um, you know, issuing uh, virtual financial assets, then the regulation is solid. It's challenging. So it is very challenging. But if you are serious, well-funded, with global aspirations and want to do things properly from the outset without cutting any corners, then it's a good place. Um, I think um, Malta has a long history, really, of, of professionals doing uh, a good job. And there are areas to improve, for example, like regulation of lawyers is one of them. Um, but that should not diminish the the great value that a lot of people who have worked here for years, trained and done things properly, uh, can bring to the table. And with that positive note, I thank you for welcoming uh, our invitation. Thanks for joining us and thank you for watching us once again.